This is AP Calculus, lesson 11-3. Today's date is Wednesday, March 20th, 2019. Today we're finally doing some volumes. All right, so um, the easiest one that I can talk about is square cross-sections. But before I talk about that, let's talk about volume in general. So, quick question. What is the name of this shape? You assume the dotted or dashed lines are in the back these lines in the front. What is the name of the shape? Review from geometry, our distant past. A rectangle. Is it a rectangular prism? It is indeed a rectangular prism. Is it going to be second? Well, you got to be fancy. Okay. Okay. Give, me, give me the area, or sorry, not the area, the volume of this. Let's assume, let's go ahead and actually label this diagram first. Let's assume that I have, I'm going to call this the length. I'm going to call this the, the width or the depth depending on who you're talking to, and this the height. So the volume is therefore equal to, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. You just multiply them all together. Length times width times height. But another way of thinking about this is I'm going to multiply length and width together. I'm going to call this shape down here, so it's this, you can kind of do some lines. This shape down here, I'm going to call that capital B. For base. The base shape is B. So another equivalency is that volume is equal to the base area times height. Are we all okay with that? All right, now give me the volume of a cylinder. Assume that this is our radius. Assume that this is our height. The volume is equal to what? Cylinder, guys. Review um, from geometry. Would it be pi r squared times It is indeed. Pi r squared times height. Just multiply these guys together. Pi r squared, of course, is a circle area. So if I do the same thing and I talk about this shape down here, and I'm going to call that the base area, this area of the base, then this formula can also be written as volume is equal to base times height. Oh, hey, that looks some, familiar to our last problem, yeah? Whatever base area I have, I just need to multiply it by height, assuming that we have a right angle for our height and our base. You're assuming that these two variables are at right angles. If it's not, then you'd have a slant cylinder or a slant um, rectangular prism, which is no longer a prism. A prism's def I think a prism's definition, if I remember correctly, is at a right angle. But you can also have a prism at a non-right angle, and it's called, I think it's maybe called something else. I need to review my geometry. Anyway, let's talk about a volume that we don't know, still using right angles. And again, these are right angles. If you want to make that note, you can say that this is a right angle, that this is a right angle. You can put that in your notes. All right, a volume that we don't know now. Let's draw a cool shape. And you can draw any shape that you want as long as it, it can be convex. It can have things that go on the inside. So this, this would be a convex shape, something like that. It can be convex. My shape is going to look like, um, and I do want to make it slightly easy on us. Let's start with a flat line and end with a flat vertical line. They don't have to be the same length, but that'll make it so that it'll chop really nicely as an integral and then do some crazy shape on the top. Crazy shape. Crazy does it shape. Yeah, you can have a point if you want. It has to be continuous, but it does not need to be. Does it need to be differentiable? No, it doesn't need to be differentiable because you can represent it with a piecewise function. Although that does make it harder. So I'm assuming that my function is differentiable, but it doesn't have to be. Again, I'm going to call this area here. B. Yeah, hopefully we don't do the hatchet plan Yes. You need to find the area of this with the hatchet planimeter, just like our lesson from the no. Hetch Hetchy. Oh, if you if you're an expert at them and you actually have a real hatchet planimeter, they are super, super accurate. If you buy like the two hundred dollar um actual like what do they call linear planimeter or the radial planimeter? Those are accurate to like, like three decimal places. So we were doing it on an uneven surface with like dirt. And yeah, with tensils and pencil, 3D printed yeah. rods and anyway. Okay. We're gonna make this into a 3D shape. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use technology to draw one line, copy it and paste it. That way it has the same length and slope. You guys are going to have to do your best to sketch that. Same length and same slope and make it into a 3D shape. Um, again, the hard part about this is you need to somehow copy this line right here, which should be a straight line, and this line right here. So I'm going to copy this to the very best of my ability. Obviously, it's not that great. And now, by getting a height on this three-dimensional surface, I can say that that is height, and that the volume of this cool shape is base times height. That base area times height. Pretty cool, pretty cool. So far, so good. We're following me. Fist of five, how well are we following so far? Five is I'm following no issues at all. Rochelle, how well are you following? Am I going too fast? All right. So what does this look like on a graph? So now on a graph, what this would look like is go ahead and draw this same shape over here on a graph. And we'll have starting line here, that same shape. And starting line here, that same shape there, some approximate area. And now we know that if we're on a graph, now we have bounds from A to B. And you might be asking me, well, Mr. Sindel, what if you don't want a flat line here and a flat line here at A and B? I want a curve. I want to have some curve or some cool shape at the end. That's possible. You just need to take the integral twice. If there's a double integral. You don't even see that. In BC calculus, I believe that's more of like um, usually your second year of calculus in college, or maybe your third year, depending on your pacing. But you can do that. You are allowed to do that. Um, so coming down here, we say that this, again, is B, and we can do it on a graph. And usually, you actually need to model this line with an equation. You'd say maybe that top equation, um, this top equation, I'm going to make that uh, red. That bottom equation, I'll make that black. So if my top equation, let's call that f of x, you somehow need to model what that equation is. And if you guys remember Kaylin working over here in BC calculus, she actually created a shape and then she had to model these two equations in Desmos. What equation is this? It's a flat line, so it's much easier to do than these curvy lines. But if you have advanced software, you can just take a picture and somehow get the math to get that uh, simulated correctly. And then this black line would be our g of x, of course. Uh, the more lines that you have, the more modeling that you need to do. Um, luckily in AP Calculus, they will tell you what that equation is. They're not going to make you find that equation. All right, all of the, the stuff that I've been talking right now is general volume. Just so you get the general idea, you have a base area, and then you have to somehow multiply by height. I'm going to make it more complex. We're making square cross sections. So assume that we have some function that looks like this. I have, I'm pretty sure this is probably like a square root function and this is a uh, parabola like x squared. Um, I have the link here if you want to go type it in. It is case sensitive, so it doesn't need to be a capital X and a lowercase g if you want to play with this. I have it luckily already pulled up for us right here. If it's going to load. Maybe I'll refresh. <laughs> Go, computer, go, go, computer. Um, if it's not up in five seconds, I'm going to skip this part. Sometimes things work, sometimes they just don't. Yeah, when technology fails you. Yeah. Anyway, um, the general idea here is you can either have squares that are perpendicular to the x-axis or perpendicular to the y-axis. This is a case. This red line right here is our x-axis, so you can actually label that right here. That is our x-axis. Um, this is our y-axis up here. So these are perpendicular to the x-axis. I want you to write that down. This is squares that are perpendicular. So I'm going to write it down here. This is perpendicular. I'm just going to say perpendicular with perp to the x-axis. It might be perpendicular to the x-axis. It might be perpendicular to the y-axis. So on a 2D plane, because that's what we're limited to by taking notes. We don't have 3D notes, unfortunately, yet. Maybe wait a few years for that. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, it would be. Um, so go ahead and do your best way of making square cross sections. You're going to be doing it again down here, so we're going to get double practice. Make your uh, cross sections. I want to see your method first, and it might be better than Mr. Sindel's method. I'm going to pause and purposely not show you 
how to make square cross sections until you try it on your own. Try to make a, a square cross section that is perpendicular to the x axis on this graph right here, and then I'm going to make you do another one down here. We'll get a lot of practice in here. Okay. Wait, actually, 3D notes are possible. I just remember this last thing in Hamilton I remember it's basically a 3D printer pen. It squirts out the filament from the tip of the pen. And you can... Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what this guy was made with a 3D pen. Yeah, we oh. got, or Martin has one. Martin has a 3D pen. Yeah, you literally use the same filament that I use on the 3D printer, printer, and put it into the pen. The pen heats it up, and you squirt it out. And as Ben said, you make three-dimensional whatever you want. It's probably really, really hard. It is hard, but if you if you Google things like, for example, this is a cool tangent. If you oh, it's up now. I could actually show you. Oh, and of course it's okay. There it goes. But on our tangent now, if you go on YouTube and search for 3D pen, like I don't know Charizard. It takes a long time, that's why they do a time lapse. Let's do a really quick 3D pen school. He made this thing with a 3D pen. And it's really hard. He started out with the head, he drew things, and then made it with a 3D pen. So 3D notes yes, are possible. Anyway, you can watch that video on your free time. Let's come back to our actual notes here. You're kidding me. It was just there. There it goes. Okay. All right. So I'm going to change X to the full boundary. That way I get all of these rectangles. Come on now. And I want a square cross section. Obviously, we could have equilateral triangles or semicircles. Those are in our future notes. And let's do one square, two squares. The more squares that you have, the better approximation of area you're going to have. So if I come over here to an infinite amount of squares, you can see what the volume is actually represented by. And it's kind of hard to see on here. If we dim the lights, we probably can see it better. On my computer, it's very clear that I have this, this line right here and this line right here where it's a very clear area. And if I were to change that out for an equilateral triangle, you could see, let me maybe make it a little bit lower. Make it a little bit lower. Come on, computer. I know it's hard. Uh, even lower, even lower. You can see what triangles would look like. And if I didn't want triangles and I wanted semicircles, I could have semicircles. Those are all different volumes. They're not the same value. Depending on the type of cross section, you will have a different volume, and the way to calculate it will be different. And we're going to be going through all of these because they're equally likely, actually, not equally likely. I know AP graders prefer some to others. Um, I think rectangles are a very popular choice, um, squares are also pretty good. Um, so, how did you make your square cross section? I want to see your. How did you guys think of and do, do it? Arrow made lines, not squares. Rochelle is still thinking about it. All right, so I will show you how to make square cross sections on your notes. So if I want this to be perpendicular to the x axis, that means if this is my x-axis, that I need to make lines like this, like arrow did, but now I need to make it into a square. So in a square, you need to make it pop out into the third dimension. This is me popping out the square into the third dimension, and now it's a square. Let's do another one. They have to be connected between these two curves, and then it needs to pop out into the third dimension. And if you do enough of them, it does eventually start to look like our shape from here. Oh. From right there. Um, let's make n a little bit lower so we can see what we should be aiming for right about there. You don't need too many squares, but it should be a square cross section. So far, so good. This is just to understand the problem, and now we're going to start doing some real hardcore math on top of this. This is all conceptual understanding. I'm about to turn it into procedural understanding. I see you're still writing, which is why I'm still talking, to give you time to copy things down. In reality, each of these squares actually has thickness. It's infinitesimally small, or I guess I should say the width is an infinitesimal, but if I take the limit as n approaches infinity, the width of each of these squares is 1 divided by n. Does that make sense so far? It's basically th or thinner than paper. It's infinitely thin slices. And we also need an infinite number of those slices as well. And eventually, you should get that area. So let's come down here and talk about uh, cross sections. Um, do I have information on the back? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's, let's stay right here. I'm going to make this a little bit more formal. Let's make a nice, easy curve. I'm going to do mine in blue on the top. A nice, easy curve. Something that's not too hard like that. Nice, easy curve on the top. 
um, feeling a little bit like Bob Ross, make make happy little f of x functions. If you make a mistake, that's okay. Happy little mistakes. Yeah, just smudge them out. You turn them into birds. And then a nice easy shape down here. We'll call that g of x. Okay, this is going to be a technical drawing. You are going to draw one cross section very, very well that has thickness. Obviously, this thickness will be big enough so we can see it. You don't want it infinitely small. So this technical drawing, you might even want a ruler if you want to be super perfect about it, but you need to have a line that goes, and I'm again going perpendicular to the x-axis. If I did perpendicular to the y-axis, it would be going this direction. I'm doing perpendicular to the x-axis, so I'm going in this direction. We're going to make one square, and it's somewhere in the center here. So this square now is going to be popped out just like before into the third dimension. So it's going to be a little bit hard to do on here. Let me see how well I can do it. Right there, and then I'm going to copy you and paste you, put you down there. I'm going to grab you, copy and paste you right here. Now I have this square cross section, but it is not in the third dimension. I now need to give it thickness. So luckily, technology makes it so I can copy and paste these two and paste these two and just move it to the side. Looks good. And then I need to make one line. I'll change it later, but if I hold option, it should let me make a new angle. And now I need to move this guy. Having thickness made it so much more 3D. Yeah, it, it totally does. Is not just copy, paste. Oh. I'm going to move you right here, paste again, move you right there. That is our technical drawing of what these slices actually look like. We're going to be using this technical drawing, and we're going to be redrawing it in a different, from a different perspective in our formula on the back side. Make sure you have a really good drawing because that is exactly what's happening. You have this three-dimensional slice where this thickness here, you guys are going to help me now. This thickness, I should be using black here because I'm not talking about either F or G. What is the thickness of the slice? What do we call it in calculus? When I want to say it's basically nothing, we always call it something. Notationally. So you guys are thinking of the, act, so you're correct in thinking of limit to infinity of like 1 over N, but I usually call this thickness dx. Could you ever have a thickness d something else? Sure. How? If it x axis Say again, louder? Um, if the x axis was a different letter. Oh, yeah. So if I just changed this from an x to a t. Yeah. Exactly. It could be dt. What about if I fix the x axis and I fix the y axis? I'm always on the x y plane. Could I have a different letter? Probably not. It's true. Yep. So what if these squares were now perpendicular to the y-axis? Then I would be drawing my squares like this, and, would be dy, right? and then it would be dy. It would be popped out, and then my thickness here would be in this direction. Sorry. Yeah, that direction. So it would be in the, the y direction. I could have a dy. Well, it can, be, it can be d anything as long as whatever the line is perpendicular to has to be d to whatever letter that is. That right? is... Yeah, say it again because we're literally writing down what you just said. Whatever the line is perpendicular to, it's always going to be D to whatever line is perpendicular to. Yeah, so we have perpendicular to the x-axis. And because of that, we are going to have, so because of this, because of this, we're going to have dx. So if I'm perpendicular to the y-axis, then it's going to be dy. And you can even write that down if you want extra stuff in your notes. So if you're perpendicular to the y-axis, that means you're going to have a dy. Always, always, always for any of these slicing questions. That might be a little bit tricky when we start talking about revolving things, which is exactly what Kaylin did. She did a solid of, or a revolution of a solid um, revolving around an y-axis, revolving around an x-axis. It will change depending off if you're a disk method or a shell method, which I, again, will be talking about later. 
All right. So far, so good. I need to now ask you, what is this length? This line right here has what length? What, what, what do you mean? In terms of f, and f, f of x and g of x, what is the length of this line? It's f, f of x minus g of x. Exactly. This length is the top minus the bottom. It's always top minus bottom. So this length is f of x minus g of x. All right. So we have that length. We have this height. And because we have a square cross section, not a rectangle, but a square cross section, this length that pops out into the third dimension is also what length? Would it be the same thing? It is the same thing. This length right here is also f of x minus g of x. How do you know it would be the same? Someone else, yeah, say it again. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. No, yeah, that's a good question. Now we really understand it. By asking questions, we can get to that true understanding. So what if it's a rectangle? Oh, what if it's a rectangle? Then what would we do? They'd have to tell you something along the lines of, and the height of the rectangle that pops into the third dimension is twice the length of the cross or so of the have length. To give you something more to, yeah, they'll yeah. have to give you something. They'll say it's going to be like two times this thing, so you'll do two times this thing or three times that something, something like that. They'll generally give you some constant scaling factor. All right, now we're on the back side. Luckily, we have uh, Mr. Sindel up here, so I can see the front side and the back side at the same time. We're going to redraw this cross section. So go ahead and redraw it nice and neat. Pretty large, too, because we're done after this. So my nice large cross section is going to look like this. Bada boom, if I hold shift, bada boom. And I'm going to try to get the same thing. So if I went one, two, three, four, five, six dots, so I'm going to make this slightly longer, make it come out to six dots, then this should also go from here up to six dots. One, two, three, four, five. Six. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Cool. Now I just need to move him down because it's not working. Right there. It doesn't matter which side is on. What axis? Uh, say again. So you know how you get a horizontal line, and then the vertical one is on this side. Oh, you're making a square now. Oh, yep. Just trying to be very precise with my my drawing. All right, and it needs to be a three-dimensional drawing, which means I need that top right two pieces to copy-paste, drag them up here to some thickness. Looks good. And let's go ahead and make our final line shape, which is going to look... I can't draw on top of it because otherwise it grabs it. If I hold Option, it'll let me make a nice line from there to right there. CV, Command-Paste, copy-paste, copy-paste, and I have beautiful drawing of that cross-section. Because it's a square, not a cube. It is a, yeah, technically it's a rectangular prism because it does have thickness and it's the third dimension. All right, let's go ahead and try to remember what each of the lengths were. And it is up on the screen if you don't remember. Try to remember, what are each of the lengths? Label it now, try not to look at it. All right, we have it labeled like this. All right, cool. So now we can actually find what that area is. And again, I'm trying to use this same terminology. If I have a base area, then I can find this base area. This square that's in the front, I'm gonna call that B. So what is our area? F of x minus g of x quantity squared. So, and this should be in the start. So our integral, so there's the first for, form. Form one is this picture right here. Form one is the cross section. And Ben is doing form two right now, which is the equation, which is the thing we need to actually get some numbers in here. 
it's going to be an integral. And he told me it's going to be f of x. Actually, I can copy and paste because I have technology. It's going to be f of x minus g of x. And then I had to do what to that, Ben? Square it. I need to square this thing. Square this thing. I can make this black as well. That thing squared. And so that represents what? What did Ben just write? Someone else tell me. What is this stuff in black squared? What did he just find in terms of a... Base. Exactly. That is the base. What we just found now was the base. What about G of X? All right. So, yeah. Now to make it the to make it a volume, we need to multiply the base times the height. The height now is D of X. So the height here is D of X. D of X. All right, and assuming that I have on my graph, let's call this uh, spot A. I'll do this in orange, so just color code this. Uh, this length right here is A, or this X coordinate here is B. So coming back on here, that's A and B, which means that if I come over here, my integral goes from A to B, lowercase a and lowercase b. All right, we're good. That's all I have for you guys. With that knowledge, you should be able to find any volume with a square cross-section now. You have a formula. You have that understanding. Let's go get them.